So I think that when we look to cover crops like that, especially in this time of the year, the first thing that comes to your mind is, well, that's good forage, right? Why not to graze? And yes, I mean, that can be an alternative when you think about uh, cover crops. Even I try to call them, as in this case, graze covers. Uh, but there are some considerations uh, when we talk about grazing cover crops because there is a blur line there if that is a cover or if that's a forage from now. So I had done a study uh, years ago where I tried different cover crops but I, I just focused on monocultures where I had uh, three different legumes and three different grasses the reason was uh, they were a small plot and work with mixtures is very difficult when we do cutting or simulating grazing because, you know, in a situation that you have a mixture like that, uh, the animal will select some of those plants. And when we are just simulating, in other words, cutting samples, well, that's not possible. So it would be not viable to do something realistic or close to what would be considered uh, a grazing simulation if we go to, to mixtures. And I don't want to describe this research per se here, I just want to share with you uh, the lessons that we learn with those cover crops uh, that we try on two different locations for two years. When trying those summer cover crops uh, during two years, as I was telling, uh, something that we did is we had the cover crop uh, during the summer and after the cover crop during the summer we have wheat and that wheat we made it for grain because the idea is to provide some cover crop and also some forage uh, during the summer and after we have wheat for grain production uh, during the fall and then the spring when we harvest. So um, the lessons that I learned is first the erratic rainfall here in Oklahoma uh, make a cover crop during the summer from a total successful to a total failure. And that is a problem because the way that I see in these two years was a kind of a gamble. In the first year, even in Perkins and in Chickasha, that was the two locations that I tried, we planted uh, 15 days after harvesting the, the wheat that was uh, about late June and right after that we plant them we have a good rainfall and good rainfall continue coming for all the wind and rainfall continue come for all the summer uh, in a well and spaced uh, amount and what happened is we had successful cover crops now in the other year it was completely different after that we took the wheat out, uh, rainfall didn't come after planting uh, the, the cover crops in late June. And in Perkins, uh, we have a total failure of those cover crops. And in Chickasha, I mean, we produce less than half that we had produced the, last, the, the other year. So that shows how erratic the rainfall can really affect your cover crop production, especially in this year. The second lesson that I learned is your type of soil and your soil fertilization status. When we go for cover crop, I mean, uh, the mantra, what they keep saying is uh, you are going to plant that and you are not going to fertilize because cover crop is supposed to be low input and those plants supposed to, the mix are supposed to have legumes that fix nitrogen and the other plants and with time you are going to build organic matter and also increase nutrient but the reality is if you are starting up from a field that you keep it fallow during the summer and after wheat well you need to to acknowledge your fertilization because those plants when you plant them they have a minimal requirement to grow for instance in Perkins you have a sand loam soil very poor in nutrients and we could see that the plants really struggle to grow even with water now, in Chickasha, we have a soil that was more a clay loam, that was fertile per se, 
and we didn't have any problems uh, growing those cover crops. So even though there is the saying that cover crops we suppose not fertilize, they are low input. Uh, keep in mind that in, in the beginning, perhaps in the first year, second year, you might need uh, to fertilize. There is no miracle. The fact that uh, weeds grow without fertilization is because they are, they are well adapted to this environment. And as you can say, we cannot use weeds as cover crops because they don't produce much biomass because they are adapted to that low water input. Now those plants, for more that they might be drought tolerant, they will use more water and also they will use more nutrients. The third lesson is weed suppression. Well, when we have a cover crop that's pretty much uh, dominated by legumes, we see that those cover crops might not be very good on suppressing weeds. For instance, uh, when we had tepary beans, cowpeas and forage soybean, in both locations we see about 30 to 50 percent incidence of weeds. Luckily, in Perkins, the weeds that came was crabgrass and you know, I hate to love and I love to hate crabgrass because crabgrass is a weed but also is a very good forage. So in Perkins, even though we had a high proliferation of crabgrass, that's still high quality and would be grazed well. Now, when we went to Chickasha, what happened is, uh, even though the suppression of the weeds were better because you have a higher fertile soil so the legumes could grow a little better. Well, the weeds that came there was pretty much stinky grass and pig weeds and you know the animals will not touch those, those weeds. So that's the problem here. So it's very important also uh, that you look at your weeds population when you are thinking about grazing because uh, those weeds can be grazed or not. Fourth and last lesson that we learned was how the amount of residue that was produced from those cover crops during the summer could affect the falling grain uh, of wheat. So we noticed that uh, cover crops that produced more than 5,000 pounds of residue per acre uh, would start to affect negatively uh, the wheat grain yield and quality. So if you produce it more than 5,000 for every 1,000 pound per acre of residue, dry residue that you had put at the top of those 5,000, you had a reduction in two bushels uh, of wheat grain per, per acre and also a decrease in uh, total uh, protein in the grain in 0.2% unit. And that was resulted what we call a co-limitation of water and nitrogen. Uh, even though rainfall came and you could have we could have a good uh, wheat germination, those cover crops that produce too much residue, more than this 5,000 pounds per acre, it used that rainfall during the summer that in a fallow or in a low residue produ production would be there in the soil storage for the wheat. And also, even though we fertilize properly the wheat, well, those cover crops also used lots of the nitrogen. So we are pretty much replenished the nitrogen that was used and therefore in the end we had less nitrogen for the wheat. So I think that those are the little lessons that we learned from this two year to location study. Of course, we are going to continue doing more studies on that uh, to see what we can learn, especially when grazing mixtures.